thank you for the invitation and good morning everybody. Um, Leonardo mentioned that I have lived and worked in New Zealand and when I was living in New Zealand I returned from uh, traveling and walked into our kitchen where our son was playing with one of his friends. Uh, both were about six years old at the time and I put down my bags and Robbie, my son, um, and I, we warmly greeted each other and then he and his friend resumed their play and then his friend turned to Robbie and said, what does your dad do? To which Robbie replied, he travels around the world doing good. But then there was a long pause, and I'm not exaggerating, it was followed by a very deep sigh. And he added, but it never works. <laughs> and Robbie had concluded that it never works because I had to keep going back again and again and again. So obviously, I didn't fix it the first time. Now clearly, this week, we're not going to fix things. But I think and I hope that we can help each other identify what needs to be done and help each other take practical, manageable next steps. And it's a real honor for me to participate in this meeting. And I participate with real humility because I'm not from this region. Uh, I've worked on right to health issues in Latin America, but uh, unlike many of you, I'm, I'm not an expert on this continent. But can I begin with a few brief comments about health rights uh, in constitutions? And as we know, some commentators in Latin America are questioning whether or not it's appropriate to enshrine health rights in constitutions and whether or not it's appropriate to ask judges to decide cases with resource implications. And I'm not going to talk at great length about this. I just want to make a, a brief response with four points. Firstly, for generations we've neglected health rights. Now, at last, we're beginning to give them the attention they deserve. Naturally, we will encounter serious methodological and other problems, and it will take time to figure out sensible solutions, just as it's taken time to clarify difficult conceptual issues around civil and political rights. And I'm really extremely confident that we can, we can tackle the health rights challenges provided provided we work collaboratively across disciplines together. Second, we mustn't forget that there are many health rights decisions where brave judges have contributed to health justice and they've saved lives and they've reduced suffering. Third, international human rights law demands equality, non-discrimination, and equity. In other words, human rights law is animated by a sense of social justice. Most law cases, most law cases require balances to be struck between different human rights considerations, including the requirement of social justice. So it seems to me that judges have the extremely difficult task of weighing up the social justice implications of various alternative decisions. And crucially, they cannot do this alone. They need assistance, a point I want to return to in a minute. I mentioned international human rights law, and I should add that the international right to health, as many of you know, the international right to health is subject to progressive realization, and it's subject to maximum available resources, and these two concepts are part of international human rights treaties that are binding on Latin American 
governments. And perhaps these concepts can help judges as they adjudicate on difficult right to health issues. And I said I'd make a fourth comment about this issue of the so-called judicialization of health rights. My fourth comment is this. Writing in the United States during the 1980s, Patricia Williams wrote the following. She said this. The word rights feels so new in the mouths of most black people. It is still so deliciously empowering to say. It is a sign of selfhood that is very hard to contemplate restructuring. Rights, she said, is the magic wand of visibility and invisibility, of inclusion and exclusion, of power and no power. The concept of rights is the marker of our citizenship. That's Patricia Williams. And after years of struggle, health rights are now in constitutions. And to their great credit, judges are taking them seriously. And as Williams insists, these advances are profoundly important to the poor, marginal, disadvantaged, and who she calls the invisible and excluded. Something troubling when privileged, middle-class commentators suggest that human rights intended to benefit the poor should receive diminished constitutional protection. After those initial comments, I'd like to make a few additional remarks about accountability. And encouraged to by the organizers, can I briefly depart from my prepared words just for a minute and comment on the concept of accountability. I used to find as a lawyer that I would mention accountability to my friends and colleagues in the health sector, but they did not share my understanding of what accountability meant. For example, I would refer to accountability, but they would hear monitoring. I would say accountability, but sometimes they would hear evaluation. So I found it necessary to unpack accountability and into three different but related concepts. And I suggest, and others suggest it too, this isn't just my analysis, I suggest that accountability has to be seen as having three dimensions. Firstly, monitoring. Monitoring meaning the gathering of information and data so we know what's happening. And health professionals tend to be very familiar with this idea of monitoring. But that's just one part of accountability. There's a second part, which is review. That is, some process or some body to consider that monitored information and data and then to assess the degree to which commitments have been kept. So review is a process or body to check whether or not commitments have been kept, promises have been kept, pledges have been honored, human rights obligations have been respected. And I suggest that this review process must include an independent element. Maybe an independent element feeding into a political process, but there needs to be an independent voice in the review process. And in my experience, whilst health professionals are very familiar with monitoring, they're not so familiar with this idea of review, an independent review. And then thirdly, after monitoring and review, accountability demands remedial action, remedy, redress. So after monitoring, after review, someone has to take when necessary, remedial action. And it's a cyclical process because that remedial action then has to be monitored. We have to check whether or not, the, by way of a review process, whether or not the action has, been, has, has taken place and is working, and we're back to maybe further remedial action.
So I put that on the table for your consideration, that, that accountability has these three things. Monitoring, review, bracket, there must be some independent element in the review process, close bracket, and remedial action. And if you want this set out somewhere, it's in this Commission on Information and Accountability for Women's and Children's Health, um, which uh, reported in 2011. So, for the interpreters to go back to my text, um, one of the most distinctive and important features of human rights is that they place legally binding obligations on states, and these obligations demand accountability. And as I intimated just now, when lawyers hear accountability, when lawyers hear accountability, I find that lawyers usually think in terms of judicial accountability. So just as health professionals, when they hear accountability, they tend to think of monitoring. Lawyers, when they hear accountability, often think of judicial accountability. Of course, judicial accountability is extremely important. Being able to go to court to vindicate human rights is vital. But judicial accountability is accountability of last resort. Other forms of accountability are absolutely essential. And for example, health rights can be vigorously taken up by national human rights institutions, by ombudsmen, by health commissioners, by parliaments and their specialist health committees, by local councils or municipalities, by local health authorities, by the governing bodies of hospitals, by civil society organizations, by the media and so forth and so on. All of these can, in some countries, and in some situations, enhance accountability for health rights. And no matter how able and how committed our judges might be, I think it's unreasonable and unrealistic to place on judges' shoulders alone the responsibility to hold everyone accountable for all aspects of health rights. This is a Herculean task that lies beyond any single institution or any single person. So this week, perhaps, we can share good practices about non-judicial accountability mechanisms for health rights in Latin America and elsewhere. And can I briefly mention one from Europe? I'm not going to name the country because plans are still being put in place. The, the inquiry has not yet been announced. However, in the European country in question, there is a real problem with accident and emergency health care. So the country's independent human rights institution will be holding a public inquiry later this year into accident and emergency health care, seen through the human rights lens. The inquiry will hold public meetings, it will take evidence, invite government, government officials to appear before it, publish a report with findings and recommendations, and it has powers to compel evidence if necessary. In short, here is a participatory, transparent, non-judicial accountability mechanism for health rights. And I respectfully suggest the heavy burden of accountability for health rights needs to be shared between judicial and non-judicial accountability mechanisms. This leads me to one of the most difficult questions in human rights law. It's the issue of prioritization. And the question, I think, is this. Given a finite budget, how is it possible to prioritize health interventions or health technologies in a manner that's consistent with the government's national and international human rights obligations. And because time is very short, I confine myself to three short points. One, we need what PAHO calls health technology assessments. A health technology is a broad term including medicines, cancer screening equipment, IVF and so on. And a health, a health technology assessment is a rigorous evaluation of a technology's properties, effects and impacts, including medical, social, ethical and economic dimensions. And it seems to me that health technology assessments can be a, very, a really useful tool for health, uh, for, for health decision makers. Formed by these health technology assessments, a decision has to be made about which technologies should be included in the publicly funded health system. And this is the very difficult issue of prioritization. Prioritization needs, I suggest, a philosophical foundation, an agreed process, and defined criteria. My third point on prioritization, prioritization and my last point on prioritization is this. The health technology assessments and prioritization must be respectful of human rights considerations, such as equity, transparency, and participation, and it must be subject to judicial oversight. Can I make a few short remarks about non-state actors in the health sector? 
to a large degree, international human rights law emerged out of the Second World War as a response to fascism, the Holocaust, and as a response to the causes of fascism, the poverty of the Great Depression. And this explains why international human rights law is primarily a binding code of behavior for states. International human rights law was mainly a response to the abuse of state power, and so international human rights law is primarily designed to regulate state behavior. But today, we all know, including in our health sectors, that they, we have numerous no, powerful non-state actors. And some of these are more powerful than states. In my view, human rights should be and can be applied in modified form to powerful non-state actors in the health sector. Human rights are at root about the regulation of power. Wherever it may be seated, whether it's state power or non-state power. And the case for applying human rights to non-state power is especially convincing when the non-state actor provides a public function and benefits from public funds. As UN Rapporteur on the Right to Health, I spend a lot of time talking with pharmaceutical companies, especially patent holding pharma. Clearly, pharma provide a public function and in many cases they benefit from public funds. And I argued that such companies have right to health responsibilities. Predictably, of course, the pharmaceutical companies were resistant. They said, if pharma have right to health responsibilities, where on earth are they? What are they? So, by way of a lengthy consultative process, and based on international human rights law, I prepared 47 human rights guidelines for pharmaceutical companies in relation to access to medicines, and I submitted them to the UN General Assembly. These guidelines are on issues such as between countries, marketing, neglected diseases, corporate disclosure of information, and so forth and so on. I also wrote a public UN report that examined the work of GlaxoSmithKline, one of the world's most powerful pharmaceutical companies, and the report looked at them through the right to health lens. And I don't want you to think this was just uh, an isolated um, maverick UN rapporteur. Uh, the UN has adopted guiding principles on business and human rights. They're known as the Ruggie principles after their main author. And the UN has established an independent body of experts to consider the human rights practices of business enterprises. So neither the Ruggie principles, I should say, neither the Ruggie principles nor the UN independent body are strong. Just the reverse. They are fledgling initiatives. Nonetheless, they confirm that the UN considers that business enterprises have human rights responsibilities. And perhaps you'd like to consider this in the context of your health systems in your countries. And it might be difficult for judges to hold accountable a pharmaceutical company or indeed another business enterprise for its right to health responsibilities. But if so, maybe this task could be undertaken by a non-judicial accountability mechanism. And in my remarks, a recurrent theme is the critical importance of transparency. Accountability depends upon transparency. If judges have the extremely difficult job of balancing an individual's claim for an expensive medicine, with a disadvantaged population's claim for social justice, then the judges need detailed information from the Ministry of Health about the implications of alternative decisions. A public inquiry initiated by a national human rights institution depends upon access to data and information. A health technology assessment, as I mentioned earlier, depends upon transparency of data and information. Priority rests upon full disclosure of criteria and their application. The public is entitled to know which services are delivered, which outcomes achieved, and to whom. Is such information accessible in all your countries? And keep in mind that transparency is legally mandated, legally required by international human rights law. A core social institution. The right to vote underpins a democratic political system. The right to a fair trial underpins a just court system. And the right to health 
underpins an effective health system that is accessible to all. And because political systems, court systems and health systems are core social institutions, it's for that reason they are reinforced by human rights. And that's the historic role of the right to health. To help us establish effective, equitable, responsive health systems upon which the well-being of individuals, populations and communities depend. Can I close with a comment about the implementation? It seems to me the greatest challenge confronting health rights is implementation. Implementation has different meanings. For lawyers, implementation means giving effect to health rights through courts and institutions, including through litigation and judicial orders. For health practitioners, implement implementation means operational health interventions, such as immunization programs, access to emergency contraception in public institutions, health promotion for disadvantaged populations, and so forth and so on. When I began my first term as rapporteur on the right to health, I was invited to the World Health Organization in Geneva to talk about implementation of the right to health. And as a lawyer, I began talking about laws, litigation, and court orders. And I remember glancing up from my notes and realizing that the audience had no idea what I was talking about. They were looking at me as if I were a visitor from outer space. When I referred to a court order upholding the right to health, they, quite rightly, wanted to know what happened. What were the health policies? What were the programs, projects, and other interventions putting the court order into practice? And if the court order was operationalized, what was the evidence of the impact of that operationalization? And they regarded, they regarded a court order without health interventions without evidence of impact, as an empty promise. They almost regarded it as a fraud. Of course, both meanings of implementation are important. The meaningful realization of health rights demands multidisciplinary collaboration amongst health professionals, human rights lawyers, and others. Two years ago, experts from both communities agreed practical guidance on human rights and maternal mortality and morbidity. This practical guidance was adopted by the UN Human Rights Council. Just last month, WHO published practical guidance on human rights and contraceptive information and services. This week, actually, as we meet, the UN Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights is hosting a multidisciplinary meeting to discuss practical guidance on human rights and under five, mortality and morbidity. So gradually, the two different meanings of implementation are merging and they are reinforcing each other. Increasingly, health professionals and human rights practitioners are working together. And it seems to me that that is the future of uh, human rights and health rights. And as my uh, six-year-old son would, would have observed, um, we're not going to fix that this week, but we can at least take some steps in the right direction. Thank you very much.